Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. I'm joined today by Chairman Scott Newman of the Transportation Committee in the Senate uh, for a joint informational hearing by the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee as well as the Transportation Committee. Sorry for the uh, shield up uh, on this particular mounting of the uh, computer, but we'll try and work around it. Uh, today, we've invited several law enforcement professionals to give testimony regarding the escalating crime, uh, often violent crime, uh, our communities are experiencing, not only in the metropolitan area, but also in outstate areas as well. It's hard to avoid the constant news and the constant headlines that we are, we've been seeing in the past year. Uh, they typ typically are uh, of shootings, murder, uh, murder of children. Uh, we've had 54 young people under the age of 18 shot uh, just in the Twin Cities area alone. Uh, a few of those have died tragically. Uh, they were not involved in any crime. They were innocent bystanders and victims of the crimes that were being participated in uh, elsewhere in their neighborhood. We also have carjackings, drag racing, robbery and aggravated assault also, to name a few. Minneapolis saw shootings and homicides soar in 2020, a trend that's continued in the first half of this year as well. Here's a few noteworthy statistics from the most recent BCA 2020 report released this summer. Minnesota recorded a 16% increase in violent crime in 2020. Most notably, 185 murders in 2020 in Minnesota compared to 117 the year before, an increase of 58.1%. After a significant downward trend over the past several years, arson rose 53.7% over 20. 19. Motor vehicle theft rose 19.7% in 2020 with 13,662 vehicles stolen as compared, compared to 11,400 in the year before. Reports of robberies were up 26% to 38, over 3,800. Aggravated assaults increased 22%. Uh, to 8,200 between 2019 and 2020. The value of property stolen in 2020 toppled 216 million, a 54% increase over 2019. The report said assaults on police officers also increased 62% uh, to 667, according to the BCA. Uh, fortunately, there were no officer fatalities during that same period of time. If that's not troubling enough, a review of previous criminal histories of those charged with criminal activity show a growing trend within our criminal justice system of prosecutors refusing to press charges and fully prosecute criminals and metro area judges deferring to lighter sentences. I believe this puts the public at risk. Today we're hearing from those who are on the front lines dealing with criminal activity on a daily basis, and this is our opportunity to listen and learn. We have five testifiers on today's agenda. They've been given approximately 10 minutes to comment. Generally, we've asked law enforcement to comment on rising crime within their jurisdictions, their opinions on how to get a handle on increasing crime and how the revolving door of the criminal justice system may be playing out in these communities. Uh, no additional testimony beyond those on our agenda will be taken at this time. After the, and I'm asking members after the testimony, testimony we'll be uh, opening it up for question and discussion. So with that, uh, let's get started. The first individual uh, that will be Chairman. given testimony is Sheriff Bob Fletcher. Uh, as Sheriff comes up, uh, I want to remind members to keep your computers muted and only uh, uh, speak into the desk microphone 
which they need to turn on. We're a little out of practice. We haven't been here for a few months. And then uh, speak close to the microphone so it's well heard. Sheriff Fletcher. Mr. You Chairman. Have, you didn't have to drive too far to come here today. No, but the parking's all gone now. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having us all here today and thank you for your summary of, of the st statistics. I won't bore you with many of those. I would like to point out, though, that the trend that you're seeing now and you just outlined began well before the pandemic and well before George Floyd's murder. This began in 2019. We saw huge increases in violence in August and September of 2019, putting us on pace to where we are now, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And for those of us that have heard people say, well, it's because of the pandemic, I want to assure you that it began before then. So in St. Paul, of course, we're headed toward record numbers of homicides. Minneapolis is going to probably top a record as well. It's not just homicides, as the chairman mentioned, shootings, victims of, uh, that are children, a dramatic increase in the last two years. As a matter of fact, you remember Chief Arundondo asked for 200 more officers in 2019 before any of the pandemic or before George Floyd's murder. He knew that he needed additional resources to address what he was seeing then. And now, not only did he not get the 200 additional, he's down 270 from the staffing that he is authorized to have. In St. Paul, St. Paul did a staffing study. They said they needed an additional 50 bodies above their 620 authorized. Today, they're at 570. So they need an additional uh, 100 bodies at St. Paul. Our agency is, was defunded by $1.1 million. The Ramsey County Board cut us in this year's budget, $1.1 million. That essentially means 12 less bodies. So we are carrying 15 less bodies because it looks like we're going to have an additional cut, additional vacancy factor cut as well. So um, the state of law enforcement in the inner city metro, oh, is that the Zoom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the state of law enforcement uh, in the inner city metro is not good. And I will tell you that if the Minneapolis referendum passes to eliminate the charter mandate of a minimum number of police officers, we are all expecting dramatic increases in crime in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. And let me say this, for those who say, well, that's Minneapolis's problem, we need to address that succinctly. All of us spend time there. What happens in Minneapolis will infect this, affect this entire state. It is the jewel of our state when it comes to restaurants, sports, and other activities that we all want to visit. But it's coming to a point where we won't allow our sons and daughters even to go down there if it continues. So is there an answer there that the state could weigh in on? I'm not sure, except it may come to this, Mr. Chair. You may have to tie local government aid to the ability of local cities to provide an adequate level of police force. I'm hoping that the Charter Amendment does not pass. But if it does, it's going to require some type of state intervention. And the State Patrol and the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office do not have the resources to rescue Minneapolis from what will happen if it con continues to shrink. Just a couple thoughts. I know I'm uh, probably going to use my whole 10 minutes here, and I apologize for that. Shooters don't start out as shooters. I spent a lot of time in juvenile justice. I know a lot about juvenile crime and how they start at age eight, nine years old. Shooters start out as juvenile delinquents and they evolve through the system. I could paint you a picture of their evolution. One of the gateway crimes is auto theft. We're seeing a huge increase in auto thefts of 13, 14, 15 years old. And those cases are not taken seriously by our justice system whose fault that is, we can have a longer debate and should during the session. But 
Shooters evolved from auto theft to drug usage to gang involvement and eventually to shooting. Virtually every shooter that we have shooting now had a lengthy juvenile history. We need to fix that. We have no place to really help kids get the help they need. We used to have Boys Totem Town. We used to have Hennepin County Homeschool. There was discussions about having a merge facility. There is no option. There's no alternative to place kids so they can get the help they need with their drug addiction, with their friend circle, with their anxiety issues, their depression issues. We need some type of location that we can stop the evolution of these children before they become shooters. When you see those numbers, think about where those shooters were 10 years before and how we could have helped them get the resources that they want. Just finally, a couple legislative tweaks. If you could, maybe your staff can write these down. Auto theft is up. What's up with it is fleeing in a motor vehicle. We need help in addressing the fleeing in the motor vehicle issue. And one thing you could do is provide an aggravated fleeing statute that when you go on the wrong side of the road or when you endanger others while you're fleeing, that that statute would be enhanced. It could be attempted criminal vehicular homicide or it could just could be aggravated fleeing. But if there's, a, there's room in there in the statute to enhance the penalty if they go on the wrong side of the road. Most agencies are ceasing to chase once they're on the wrong side of the road. Let's elevate that crime and make it higher. There is a statute, and I know, I know Chair Limmer is very concerned about privacy, I am as well, but there's a statute regarding placing trackers on cars that prohibits us from placing trackers on any car without the owner's permission. We would like that statute to exempt stolen cars. Quite often, we come across stolen cars that we could track they're on the move, we have undercover cars, we have a grant from your Commerce Department on auto theft, it's a great program. But we're not allowed by statute to actually put a tracker on a stolen car. So if you can carve out an exemption, we'd have much better success in tracking those stolen cars. Obviously, you've read in the paper, I'm concerned about county attorney discretion. I think we should have a longer conversation about that. I think you need to limit what the county attorneys choose to enforce and not enforce. That's the statutorial duty of yours, not the county attorneys. And obviously we need some, some uh, help there. Shot spotter technology, we'd love to have it in St. Paul, some type of grant program where you could help facilitate the financing of shot spotter would be great. Mandatory minimums for gun crimes. Um, What's happening is that because some, some in the court system and some in the attorney, attorney system don't want to sentence people for that long, they're generally pled down to something other than the actual gun offense. So somehow we need to make sure we have some mandatory minimums on those gun offenses that aren't pled down on a regular basis. When the state patrol comes here, what would really help us is to have their helicopter up 12 hours a day, minimum, 12 to 18. That's the biggest tool that we have when we're chasing people around. And, and let me just say, auto theft has evolved into carjacking, street robberies, burglaries. These kids are using these stolen cars as a passport to committing other crime because they know most agencies will not chase them if they run. We still do at the sheriff's office, I would say, Half the departments will still chase, but most inner city law enforcement officers are not allowed to chase. We need the helicopter up to give us eyes on, or it could be the plane, either one's fine. Um, the BCA does a great job in their DNA funding, but we're collecting DNA on everything. We, knew, we need to expand the BCA's DNA processing so they can get them done faster for us. It's, it's, a, it's a hell of an investigative tool and we need it as well. Um, one last thing I'll leave you with. We, uh, we fought hard and you supported our desire to expand the violent crime enforcement teams last year. 
There was a million dollars allotted to expand those violent crime enforcement teams. Thank you for that. There was a quarter million set aside for Metro Transit violent crime enforcement team. And we are going to end up returning to those days. If you recall, three years ago, we were concerned about Metro Transit. Well, during the pandemic, no one really rode on Metro Transit. Well, as people return to normal, they're going to ride on it again. Unfortunately, I know we asked for two million originally, that number shrunk. We're having a hard time getting Metro Transit to agree to that concept because of the limited amount of funding. So we have $250,000 that's set aside for that. But as we ramp up next year, it would be great if we could expand that pool for a Metro Transit violent crime enforcement team. And I'll conclude my remarks and thank you. I don't, I don't know if the questions are an hour later. Uh, Sheriff, we'll hold questions until after all have given testimony. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, we uh, have next on our list uh, Chief Eric Warner, who is joining us via uh, Zoom. <coughs> Chief Warner, are you, can you hear us? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chief Warner here, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Proceed. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to stay. And I'm going to go off one uh, comment that the sheriff made is what is happening is going to start to affect the rest of the metro area and I believe ultimately the state. Uh, my comments are going to focus on what we're experiencing in Maple Grove. And I'm also want to speak um, the, to the effect that this is having on um, our ability to staff our agencies um, across the state. Uh, Maple Grove historically has been known as a low crime uh, community where our officers are focused on non-crime service related um, activities. However, however, over the last year and a half, we've observed a shift. And I believe that shift is what the sheriff spoke to um, that's reaching our community. We have seen an increase in burglaries, theft from vehicles and vehicle thefts that are that involve non Maple Grove residents juveniles that and that have uh, suspects have gang ties and they are carrying weapons. Our intelligence uh, shows that these uh, offenders uh, involve multiple agencies and they are impacting the safety in our neighborhoods. To give you some brief uh, statistics, our burglaries from 2019 to 2020 have gone up from 77 to 106 and we believe we're on pace to match that number in 21. Our theft from vehicles increased from 163 in 2019 to 256 in 2020. And again, we are, uh, believe we're on pace to match that number in 2021. Also our uh, vehicle thefts, um, they have remained consistent. However, we are experiencing um, crimes related um, uh, to the stolen vehicles uh, throughout the metro area, particularly those that want to, uh, offenders that want to flee our officers when they, um, when they are attempting to stop the suspects. A couple uh, incidents that, or a few incidents I think are noteworthy. Just this past month on uh, the 15th of, uh, of uh, October, we've had an armed carjacking where the vehicle was stolen in one of our residential neighborhoods that we believe involve suspects not from our city. On the 6th of this month, we had multiple shots fired into the window of an apartment complex. And fortunately, no one was hit or injured during that incident. And going back to December of uh, 2019, Monique Bao was uh, involved in a homicide incident where she was abducted from our city. She was a realtor brought to the city of Minneapolis and she was shot and killed. And that was, uh, our understanding is that the victim's boyfriend was also shot because he was involved uh, as a possible snitch. So as we are dealing with the specific crime areas within our city, we also know that criminals are transient and they, they carry weapons with them. While the numbers may not seem significant, we've, in, we've seen an increase in the possession of firearms by uh, felons or those ineligible to carry firearms. In 2020 or 2019, we, we had four crimes. We were up to 10 crimes. So that's, uh, again, the uh, fits with the uh, nature of what's going on in the metro area. I also just want to make a side note, and I don't know if my colleague to the east in Brooklyn Park is with uh, us here today, 
uh, but we've also seen and observed an increase in crime to our uh, neighbors to the east, which has resulted in nearly a doubling of um, my agency's request to back their agency um, from 2019 to 2020. As they're experiencing that crime, that affects our resources. And as we are um, willing to help out our neighboring partners, we, um, we know that we still have to police our city and deal with the uh, increases that we're facing. I think an important question to ask in the committee to hear is how is this affecting our officers and our police forces in the metro area and across the state? Simply put, officer morale, I believe, is at the lowest point that I've seen in my uh, career. And also, um, I think my colleagues would um, agree with that. Currently, Maple Grove is trying to recruit up to nine officers. Some of those are additional officers. However, many of them are uh, retirements and retirements that have left um, a few years early because of the current environment. Officers and, and my colleague chiefs across the state are also uh, uh, feeling this shortage and they believe it's the impact of the current climate and narrative against police. And uh, many people are choosing not to enter the profession or as I said, leave it early. I just wanna speak specifically to one experience on, on how personal this is. This morning before this committee hearing, I accepted the resignation of one of my well-respected veteran officers who, who quite frankly said, um, I am submitting this retirement letter two years early because the system is failing us and there's a sense of lawlessness out there. And I am not gonna put my career and my life and my family at risk anymore. And um, this is the right time to retire. So if we look forward to solutions, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, there are a couple of things and some of them were already mentioned. I think we need to have uh, a discussion about prosecutorial discretion. Uh, it seems as if there's a, uh, a desire or a thought that taking prosecutorial discretion to uh, decide on large categories of statutes to enforce and essentially uh, uh, making our police work ineffective in dealing with the crime that we have um, and, and that we're facing. Uh, the bail requirements and the sign and release, they should be at maximum limited to minor offenses. When you're seeing sign and release warrants for felonies um, such as motor vehicle theft, and we, as uh, was previously testified to, the impact of stolen vehicles um, across the metro area, I, it does not seem reasonable that adults should be allowed to sign and, and uh, be released on a felony warrant for stealing vehicles. Additionally, I have in front of me our Hennepin County Attorney's uh, bail requirements that identified 19 crimes for which uh, bail will no longer be requested. And I think a discussion needs to happen about um, is that bail reform effective? And then lastly, I would just like to uh, make a comment about the request for the State Patrol helicopter and that, uh, the support that that would provide uh, for our officers that um, are limited in their chase or no longer allowed to pursue. If this committee would remember a few years back, um, the State Patrol and, re and uh, Metro area agencies were asked to reevaluate their pursuit policies um, after some very public incidents. And a solution is not to expand our pursuit policies and increase the danger um, to the public and as well as our officers, particularly the, in light of the current climate. So as we look to um, how we solve this problem, I think the, the general accountability for those that are committing the crime, reevaluating our bail requirements and taking a look at prosecutorial discretion uh, would be some solutions I would ask the legislature to have some discussion on. Mr. Chair, I uh, want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I stand for any questions. Thank you, Chief Warner. Um, I want to thank you for participating today. I understand that, uh, Chief, you are uh, short of time today, and you won't be able to participate uh, much longer in our meeting. So I'm going to make an exception if there's anyone that has any questions or comments about Chief Warner's comments today. I don't see any, but um, I did want to remind you, Chief, um, you and I had a discussion not too long ago about the rising uh, uh, incidence of uh, drug activity 
and also uh, murders that have happened in the Maple Grove area in the last few years, uh, which is really quite uncommon for an outlying suburb uh, such as Maple Grove. And I was wondering if you could uh, expand on that uh, just a little bit. Uh, Senator Limber, members of the committee, um, I'll speak to the uh, um, number of homicides that our uh, city experienced. In 2019, uh, Maple Grove experienced two homicides. That one of those uh, homicides was drug related uh, that involved um, a body that was found in a park with um, um, obvious uh, drug material around that body. And it was clear that that was some type of drug deal that had gone bad. Normally, Maple Grove experiences one homicide every couple or few years. In 2020, the city of Maple Grove experienced five homicide incidents with seven victims. Now, while those homicides were domestic related and one was um, mental health related, that is nearly um, a fifth of all the homicides in the history of our city. In addition to those homicides, um, uh, in 2020, we had a third degree homicide and that is uh, was, or what would normally be uh, classified as a homicide, and that was due to uh, an heroin overdose where we were able to identify um, the dealer and, and uh, charge the supplier for that, that murder. Again, when I look at that particular incident, my overdoses have nearly, have gone from about 10 a year to I believe it was um, 70 in 2020. So the increased drug activity in our city, particularly the use of heroin, is having a negative impact um, on our on our city, and that's uh, and, and that's seen in the uh, homicide that I spoke of just briefly. Uh, Senator Limmer, I'll stand for any other questions you may have. All right, uh, I do believe uh, Senator Ingerbritsen has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chief, for being here today. And um, just a general question: I know you participate, I'm sure, with the uh, suburb. Uh, chiefs of police in your in our area. I don't know how many cities there are in Hennepin and Ramsey County besides Minneapolis, St. Paul, but I know there's a lot. And what we're what I'm seeing and, and um, having some experience in law enforcement, but it's been some years. I, I'm seeing this this moving the sprawl, the the crime moving more so into the into the uh, suburb area. Is there is there a lot of discussion of that? Uh, Maybe that sounds like a foolish question because I, I too watch the news at night and I'm seeing an awful lot of crime, uh, and and it's not just now you know in in the metro area it's starting to sprawl out into the suburbs. So, uh, has the group uh, that you participate with uh, been concerned of that and and you noticed a lot of that or I mean just give me your general feeling about where that's happening, Chief Horner. I. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Inga Rotson, uh, yes, there has been discussion with the Hennepin County Chiefs of Police Association, with, which represents um, all the agencies within um, Hennepin County, and I believe it's for about 45 communities that are in uh, that are non-Minneapolis communities. And yes, there is a general sense of a rise in crime in Hennepin County. I can give um, some quick data about the county itself. Um, that was provided to me by Chief Reverend, who is the current president of the uh, Hennepin Chiefs Association. During the fourth quarter of 2020, there was a 30% increase in violent crime when compared to the fourth quarter in 2019. <clears throat> there was a 3% increase in the fourth quarter of 2020 compared to the fourth quarter data in 2019 in property crime. And there was a 7% increase in fourth quarter of 2020 when compared in part one crime when compared to the fourth quarter data in 2019. And there's there's more specific data available to each community, but uh, I would say a good two thirds of the communities in the suburb have experienced increase in crime in the suburbs. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions by members? We'll move on to the next uh, Testifier, uh, thank you, Chief Werner, and I understand that you will have a new position with the Chiefs of Police uh, Association in the state of Minnesota. Uh, what What is that official title? Uh, Senator Limber, thank you. Um, I do have that position now, and it's the uh, uh, president of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, 
And I'm also the former president of the Hennepin Chiefs Association. So that means we'll be hearing from you a little bit more in upcoming, in the upcoming year for sure. I'm sure you will, Senator. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Uh, Chief Blair Anderson from St. Cloud, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please uh, proceed. Members of the committee, um, we're, we're faring a little bit better in St. Cloud than, than our colleagues and our partners down here, but we're not immune. Uh, I think one of the more salient points that have been made by uh, both previous speakers uh, is the, the sprawl that we're seeing. Uh, St. Cloud may seem like it's far away to some people, but it's not. And we, we do get a significant amount of spillover uh, or of criminals bringing their criminal activity to our area and to our region. One of the things that is most troubling uh, for me, and, and we have seen an uptick in some of our part one crimes. We've seen an uptick on uh, the number of gun calls that we've taken uh, over the last couple of years. We are encountering more people carrying firearms. Most of them are not authorized to. But let me share something with you here that I think illustrates the point. We had a very serious crime, and, and because it is still in an active stage, I can't share a lot of details with you, but it's, it's a very serious crime. All of the parties involved, and without using their names, were on probation, parole, or some other form of supervised release. None of them had been compliant with their probation or parole officers for the entire time since they had been released. This is a huge problem. And so if, if the question is asked how, how you all can help or, or how we can help ourselves, that cannot continue. Our job is to find bad guy, arrest same. When we do, imagine how frustrating that is if you're the arresting officer and before you finished your report, that person's back out on the street. And they don't have the mindset of thinking that they're getting a second chance, so they're gonna reform. They continue to commit more crime, which is the case in the incident I just explained to you. In a separate incident where a child lost his life and the person who was responsible was arrested and we tried to charge that person federally. This person had a criminal record, a felony record, as long as a Minnesota winter. And we were not able to get the US attorney at the time to charge this individual. I stopped counting at nine felonies. And in the year since he was released, He's committed more crimes. Fortunately, we arrested him again last week and we have continued to appeal to the U.S. attorney and they finally agreed to charge this guy federally. But think of all the victims in the year that that person was out of jail. And these are not isolated incidents. These are people that clearly should be locked up. We, we can't arrest our way out of all of the problems we have, but when we do get the right people in handcuffs and take them to jail, that's where they should stay. And, and for anybody who thinks that sounds too harsh, um, I, I would invite them, them to, to do a ride along or, or to do a follow up when we circle back to check on the victims of those crimes. Ask their opinion. And so that, that is deeply troubling um, for me. Um, when the question is asked what, what you all can do or, or what we can do to help or make things better, I do have a few suggestions. I, I'm not the guy that, that comes here and gripes and doesn't have any suggestions. And they're real world and I think sustainable solutions. We have to start supporting the things that we know work. For example, community engagement initiatives work Early and sustained intervention, to Sheriff Fletcher's point, works. 
We need some permanent funding sources for those kinds of initiatives. Multidisciplinary teams work. In St. Cloud, we have a community action team because believe it or not, the, the largest spike that we've seen in terms of calls has to do with behavioral health, has to do with people who are in a mental health crisis. And those are the things that get the 22nd news bite where they show an officer who encounters somebody in a mental health crisis. We're not mental health professionals. And, and I'll be honest, and I don't mean this to be uh, sound as acerbic as it does. If, if I wanted to be a mental health professional, I would have gone to medical school and been a psychiatrist. But when we get those encounters wrong, we're vilified as being incompetent. That is not something that is in our wheelhouse. And so we work with mental health professionals in our city to make sure that people get to the right service provider. Um, we did a, we did a unscientific, unofficial study and we had one person that had over 140 encounters with police. One individual where that person was either taken to jail signed in on a 72-hour hole in the emergency room or placed in the detox. After we brought all of, for lack of a better way of saying it, the right service providers together to work on this individual's case, and we used five people, we didn't just use one, the number of encounters in one year went from over 100 to zero. It's not rocket science. It's just a matter of getting people to the right place to get the right help that they need. Co-response models work. If you've never heard of the Denver model, I would invite you all to look into it. And that is when a mental health professional is paired with a police officer to answer those calls. The police officer's presence is there simply to do a threat assessment. And once that environment is deemed safe, we step out of the way knowing that sometimes just our presence is an escalator. It works. We have one in St. Cloud. My goal is to have enough for 24 hour a day, seven day a week coverage, because it works. I know I'm limited by time, but I, I, I could go on and on all day long. Uh, but I do want to thank the committee again for, for the opportunity to visit with you guys and share with you. Uh, and incidentally, again, we're faring a little bit better uh, in St. Cloud with respect to morale. Um, I, I'm at full staff. Um, I've had some people retire maybe a little bit earlier than they wanted to. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to replace those people. I just graduated 18 cadets in the last three weeks but the number of applicants is down significantly. Uh, when I started 26 years ago, I, I applied for the state patrol. There were 900 applicants for 40 spots. The last time we posted, we had nine spots. We got 40 applications. And we all know that's because of the narrative. We all know that people are, are thinking twice about doing their job and perhaps being prosecuted and sent to prison. And what is going to happen if we don't change course is that a lot of good, decent, hardworking police officers are gonna to continue to leave this profession and we're gonna be left with the ones that we don't want. Thank you again for your time this morning. And, and I will stay for questions as well. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll move on uh, with Sheriff Brandon Thien from Chisago County. <clears throat> Sheriff, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chairman Limmer and Chairman Newman and committee members. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, Chisago County is uh, referencely uh, uh, in close proximity to the metro area, only being about 30 miles to the north. We do have I-35 that runs the entire length of uh, Chisago County. I can tell you in, in 2021, uh, about 53% of 
uh, arrestees in my county jail uh, are not county residents, and that's uh, fairly typical. We do deal with a lot, a lot of uh, arrestees from uh, neighboring counties as well as the metros. In Chisago County, we have seen experiences in um, gun calls, uh, burglaries, vehicle thefts, uh, drug-related crime, and as uh, others have mentioned, uh, pursuits. I can tell you um, in Chisago County, we still do pursue, uh, depending on the situations. I can also tell you that exactly 50% of the people that um, this year that we have either caught in a pursuit or identified them being involved in the pursuit do come from the metro area being Ramsey, Hennepin, or Anoka County. So, and actually, when our deputies are making contact with these suspects, a lot of them are even surprised that we have pursued them. They make comments that in the metro they are not pursued. So to Sheriff Fletcher's comment, numerous agencies uh, in the metro area are no longer pursuing. And some of those policy decisions that are being made in other locations do have an effect on other law enforcement agencies in the proximity. Another uh, example to Sheriff Fletcher uh, talking about shooters and, and uh, juveniles. We recently had a situation where we stopped a juvenile um, that actually resided in a, in a county to the north of us, but we had come in contact with him because he was in a stolen vehicle traveling through Chisago County to head back to Ramsey County. And we had learned that this juvenile was spending time in Ramsey County learning about carjacking and actually ve vehicle thefts. So he was coming and was contributing to the problem in Ramsey County. Our drug task force um, is centr centrally located with four counties in our area. In speaking with them, uh, obviously, the, uh, like many other locations, the quantities of drugs that we are dealing with are getting much higher. In speaking with the drug task force, they explain that basically in every investigation that they deal with, if they go high enough up on the food chain, they will find that the supplier is coming out of our metro area. So when we come to the metro area, the local drug task forces that are locally here, when we ask them for help, a lot of times they are dealing with cases with bigger amounts, bigger fish than what we are dealing with, and have, to and have problems getting uh, support locally from that for our cases that uh, we end up in the metro. In reference to how our deputies in Chisago County are doing, um, I can tell you that um, we are we have been one to two short. However, we've been lucky enough to have internal candidates that we've been uh, hiring out of our jail. Uh, like Chief Anderson explained, the amount of applicants is significantly less. The last time I posted um, for a deputy position, I, I had 19 applicants. To ask how my deputies are doing, they're fatigued. Um, we are close to the Metro, so uh, over the last couple of years dealing with uh, civil unrest, we've been involved in helping. We've been up north on line three helping other sheriffs. We are tasking our deputies with other duties besides their normal patrol duties and their normal assignments, whether it's SWAT, mobile field force, drone teams. For an agency my size, I don't have a lot of personnel that I have that can do some of those specialty items, so I have to dual purpose my deputies, and that puts a strain on them. I can tell you that they're hesitant to do their job. They are feared of being prosecuted for making an error, fear of being harassed for doing their jobs based on political immediate response. They're concerned about the deadly force statute and where that will go. They're concerned about the discussions about qualified immunity being taken away. All this weighs on our deputies and officers in the state of Minnesota. My, I, my admin is constantly having to reassure them that we are supporting them, that they have support to be proactive, to stop those cars, to stop crime. As far as seeing a revolving door in the court system, I can tell you from speaking with the men and women of my agency, they do believe that they are dealing with more people on a regular basis. They are seeing repeat offenders. We have uh, an individual that we arrested for DUI. He's released and within a several hours later, he's now committing a vehicle theft. The repeat offenders is what we're dealing with. These people continue to commit crime. I do believe there's a code effect a little bit there with the courts being shut down. I think there's a lot of criminals that have been taking, uh, uh, taking advantage of the system. Probation's not able to keep up with them. 
with the court systems being uh, uh, not in full swing, they're not brought in front of judges for their original uh, crimes in a timely manner. They are then released and they're then committing more crimes. And then when they do get in front of the judge and maybe get sentenced, they're wrapping all those charges into one. They're serving that time concurrently and they're getting off easier. So they go on a crime spree. That's why we're seeing them over and over and over. They realize the system is broken currently. As far as lack of prosecution for traffic stops, I don't have that problem in Chisago County. My county attorney both agree that uh, crimes that are committed uh, in reference to traffic stops need to be prosecuted. I think we all know from uh, hearing the state patrol and seeing the statistics that fatalities are up statewide and including in Chisago County. I can tell you that um, making criminal cases off of um, traffic stops is very important. We had, a, we had a situation where we stopped someone for a minor equipment violation. You might have seen it, we posted about it. And it ended up being, uh, we found an individual that had a uh, warrant for uh, murder, homicide of the third degree out of Anoka County. Traffic is very important, not only for uh, traffic safety, but we believe that making those stops, being proactive is the way that you start to make cases. It makes your community safer and we will continue to do that. That is one reason why we post about that because some of these decisions that are being made at a local level in the cities gets the media attention. Everyone's talking about it. It's on social media. My constituents, my residents call me asking, are you doing these things? What is happening? We are not dealing with crime. And that's why we were out there telling them that we are proactive. We are putting people in jail. We are stopping cars. It's very important for the safety of our communities. As far as what can be done, what can be done to help us, to Chief Anderson's comment, I cannot echo enough the importance of dealing with mental health issues, whether it's funding, staffing, training, facilities. I know that that topic is very wide and broad, and we could talk all day just on that topic, but it is a problem and it does need attention, and we do need your help with that. Even in our jails, the amount of people that we're seeing on the streets. I have other similar situation that Blair Anderson has talked about in reference to the amount of the same people that we are constantly dealing with, with mental health issues. We need help with the roadblocks with regards to um, proactive enforcement um, not being uh, the thing to be doing and fear-based police reform. When that is out there, that is not helping our profession. It's actually shutting the profession down. That's why we have people leaving the job early, retiring early. The issues that we have with our officers and their, their mental health If the public doesn't want something to be illegal, then we need to remove that from the laws. Instead of making the decisions that it's not gonna be enforced, not prosecuted. The don't enforce or will not prosecute the current laws leads to the public to believe law enforcement is being shelved. And that is not the message. That actually, I believe, causes fear in the general public. And that's what I've seen from my constituents that are reaching out to me in reference to some of these decisions being made. We need stricter sentencing guidelines for those repeat offenders for violent crime. It's obvious that these individuals have not learned and are not learning. Something has to be done to stop that. And I agree with Sheriff Fletcher's uh, comments in reference to uh, fleeing, and there needs to be um, tougher consequences for those repeat offenders. On the felony list, fleeing is very low as far as the uh, <coughs> statute of uh, enforcement and gaining those criminal points. That needs to change. These individuals are putting uh, our, our deputies themselves and everybody on the roadway in danger. Thank you for having me here today and thank you for your time. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Brian Peters from the Minneapolis Peace and Police Officers Association. And then after that, we'll open for questions. So we'll begin with uh, Brian Peters. 
Welcome to the committee. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brian Peters and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. The MPPOA represents 10,000 plus public safety officials who hold active law enforcement licenses in the state of Minnesota. Our members include rank and file police officers, correctional officers, and dispatchers. MPPOA's, MPPOA is the largest association representing public safety professionals in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for holding the hearing today. We stand with our partners in law enforcement, the chiefs and sheriff who have testified earlier. MPPOA as the voice of rank and file officers has consistently advocated and supported measures to make policing better and communities safer. We value accountability, transparency, and justice. Building further community trust is something officers work to improve every day. When MPPOA considers policy proposals, we review which ones will help lead to a safer community with less crime, as well as more help for victims of crime. And which proposals need, uh, seek to needlessly demonize those who protect and serve. We look forward to the con continuing these conversations and finding areas that we agree on and can build community trust and relationships, improve policing, and move forward together as a state. I first want to address the issue of traffic stops. They're the most common point of contact Americans have with police each year. There are about 20 million traffic stops. Minnesota State Patrol data from 2018 to present shows that 1.18 million traffic stops in our state, 6,217 6, led to warrant arrests and 932 for firearms. A report from Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Appreh Apprehension shows 200 police officers since 20 th 2013 have been assaulted on routine traffic stops, nine involving the use of a firearm against an officer. There's been this talk about having unarmed traffic units patrolling some of the cities. If unarmed traffic units were to initiate a stop that involves, evolves into a more advanced situation, they would be ill-equipped to deal with that situation. Recently, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi announced that he will no longer prosecute most felony cases arising out of low-level traffic stops. Basically, the county attorney just announced his office would, won't uphold the law and won't prosecute those who break it. That's absurd and a slap in the face to victims of crime. Those that break the law, particularly at a felony level, won't even get a slap on the wrist and left, left to commit more crime and more serious offenses. Reduction of crime and public safety for all should be our focus as crime rate escalates. And this isn't it. Now let me address the issue of defunding the police, or some people use other terms. But it's essentially limiting and lowering the number of police available to serve our communities. Let me be clear. When people speak of defunding the police or wanting less police, the result is emboldening those who choose criminal activities. When people speak of not prosecuting crimes or reducing sentences, the result is emboldening those who choose criminal activities. This does not keep people safe. Frankly, what do we think would happen when we talk about defunding? Did we expect crime to de decrease? It's ridiculous and it's not serious or an educated approach. And again, does not keep people safe. Nobody, nobody deserves to be a victim of crime. Committing crime and, and emboldening criminals is unacceptable, period. Let me move to the support of law enforcement. Because it truly matters to increase safety in our communities. In all, law enforcement has thousands, if not millions of interactions with the public every day. And we know law enforcement isn't perfect. We're all humans. But one need only to turn on the nightly news to understand that law enforcement across the state is facing unprecedented challenges. This leads us to a great challenge, retaining and recruiting quality officers 
that work to keep our community safe. The conundrum facing all law enforcement is the need to uphold to the highest standards of professionalism in an increasing violent society while ensuring that the applicant pool is sufficient and meets the needs of the community they serve. Let me put it a different way. Support of public safety officials really does matter. Law enforcement needs to be supported with community trust to do their job and enforce the law and help victims of crime. If not, enough quality candidates won't, be in, won't want to be in this profession. Or if departments are defunded, we will see less help for the community safety needs and justice for victims of crime. Many communities do support their public safety officials, and that's greatly needed and appreciated. Lastly, before I end, I'd like to read some quotes from police officers that came to us through a survey. They're representative of the overall comments we've received. And I'll note, unlike the chiefs and sheriffs, most rank and file officers are unable to speak publicly on these issues. So I'll read their comments anonymously. From a police officer in the Twin City suburbs, the overall morale in our department is extremely low. Changes in the past year is mainly coming from our mayor and city council's lack of support for our officers. Leaders could boost morale by simply showing their support for the police department, which shows support for victims of crime and against those who commit crime. From an officer in St. Paul, since Floyd's death, I've experienced numerous individuals that I come across during the course of my duties that have made vague threats to me and my family. My kids text me during my shift, afraid for my safety. Teachers have expressed bullying at school for my kids. People on the street have become extremely disrespectful and have no fear of discipline or accountability. From another officer from the Twin Cities. I've experienced a large shift in attitude from the general public while performing my duties. Subjects of, in, of an investigation become regularly non-compliant and refuse to follow commands. Many refuse to identify his or herself even during a lawful investigation. Routine, routinely, routinely on calls for service, bystands, bystanders have interrupted investigations to video or check on subjects talking with police officers. Another comment from an officer in northern Minnesota. Defunding law enforcement is only going to make the issues worse. One of the first things cut will be training, and then we'll see officers making more and larger mistakes as they're not prepared to deal with situations. It will also likely mean less police officers on the street, which will lead to increase in crime. I have uh, one more from an officer in the Twin Cities. Officers feel unwanted and less supported in the communities they serve. I don't think I would stay in my current department and I'd start looking elsewhere. I would even highly consider changing career paths. In closing, I want to thank you for your time today and your service. I sincerely believe we all share the same goal of improving trust between citizens and law enforcement and pursuing safer communities for all. Let's continue to work together on smart and practical ways to improve the profession and community safety. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Um, uh, I wanted the record to show that we did invite uh, Prosecutor John Choi to this event, but he had a scheduling conflict and was not able to attend. Also, uh, in your packets, members, there's a letter from public defender uh, James Fleming. I believe it's from Ramsey County. Uh, and uh, he has a testimony, a written testimony that you should all review. We'll now open it up for questions and comments. Senator Latz will begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, and thank you to the uh, testifiers. Um, actually, before Mr. Peters leaves, could he give us the numbers that, once again that he cited on the warrants, uh, the traffic stop warrants and arrests that were resulting? I didn't quite get those numbers down. 6,200. So the Minnesota State Patrol data from 2018 to present shows that out of 1.18 million traffic stops in our state, 
6,217 were for warrants and 932 for firearms. Mr. Chairman, may I follow up? Senator Lett. Uh, uh, Mr. Peters, um, do you have the data on um, what was the reason for the stop broken down? Were they uh, equipment violations or what might be characterized as non-safety related conduct that led to the stop? Or was this, did they run the plates and got registered owner, came up with warrants? Were they, so there were warrant checks before the stop was made? Um, was it driving conduct such as DWIs or <coughs> swerving or, or erratic driving that led to the stops that resulted in uh, running uh, the, the individuals in the vehicle to see if there were warrants and so on? Do you have that breakdown? Mr. Chair, Senator Mr. Lance, I don't, but I can uh, certainly uh, try to get that information and, and submit it to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Maybe. Peters, uh, I believe that information was accumulated by our state troopers. And um, just as a source, um, I'm sure Mr. Peters could dig into that a little bit, but I wanted the record to show that state that, that figure came from the state troopers. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I guess part of the reason for my question is to put this into context. I think just evaluating those the numbers as they were presented alone is insufficient for us to understand the value and importance of traffic stops um, and, and so on. I'm, I'm not going to try to figure out the percentages here, uh, but 7,000 out of 1.8 million stops is a fairly low percentage anyway. So I think there's one question that I think County Attorney Choi was addressing, which is what's the value of making a huge number of stops when uh, for non safety-related driving issues, um, and what do you get in return for those? Not to minimize the crimes that were committed or the warrants that were out there and so on, but maybe resources are better directed in other forms of investigation. Uh, but mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, that, that was a little bit of a diversion from what I had raised my hand to, to speak to, but while Mr. Peters was here, I, um, so if I may, um, I, I listened very carefully and with great interest to our law enforcement testifiers. Um, they're on the front lines. They provide uh, incredible insight and value um, and uh, expertise um, in, in the question before us, which is what are the causes um, of and what can we do about rising levels of crime? I know it was interesting uh, from Sheriff Fletcher uh, that <coughs> Uh, these trends began before the pandemic and before um, the George Floyd murder. Um, and uh, we could have a whole hearing just on those issues alone. Uh, but my concern um, is with the, the scope of the, the hearing here today and with the range of testifiers we have. Uh, as I said, they're very valuable and important piece um, in this puzzle. But it seems to me this hearing is an in inadequately narrow approach to the task it sets out to accomplish, which is determining the causes of the increase in crime. Uh, we acknowledge the increase in crime and its impact on individuals and on the community as a whole. And as uh, Mr. Peters said, no one uh, should have to become a victim of crime. Uh, but there are many additional sources of expertise available to consider when seriously trying to solve this problem. And those sources were explicitly excluded by the committee chairs from participation in this hearing. They include criminologists, public health experts, mental health community advocates, youth intervention experts, experts on the impact of the pandemic on crime and on the impact of uh, law officer misbehavior, such as in the uh, George Floyd case on community trust um, and on the proliferation of crime. Uh, but the, the chairs of this hearing did not invite these voices to the table. In fact, uh, I was very explicitly informed uh, by uh, the committee uh, that they would be prohibited from testifying um, at this hearing. Were we to suggest uh, any non-law enforcement uh, people to testify? So the narrow focus of, on of this hearing on law enforcement comes nowhere near the breadth of an inquiry that would be necessary to address the problem. Um, and we couldn't even 
remedy this limitation by suggesting one or two additional law enforcement participants, um, as we were invited to do by the staff. So again, I appreciate the testimony. Uh, but uh, Mr. Chairman, we have right in our community here uh, some uh, incredibly uh, experienced experts in, in crime. We have uh, Professor Jillian Peterson, a nationally recognized criminologist, a professor at Hamlin. We've got Professor James Densley, who chairs the School of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice at Metropolitan State University and is a longtime <coughs> expert on street violence in cities. Um, even cited in the uh, uh, Pioneer Press article um, that um, I believe was included in uh, packets, not entirely sure, but it was just about a week ago. Uh, Gary LaFree is currently a professor at the University of Maryland's Department of Criminology, Criminology and Criminal Justice. Um, professor Randolph Roth of Ohio State University's Criminal Justice uh, Research Center. Uh, professor John Gould, um, who is a, a, a criminologist uh, most recently at Arizona uh, State University and now um, at a California University directing their uh, uh, programs. Um, there is a wide range of people whose lifetimes have been uh, dedicated to exploring the causes of crime, um, the pattern and history of crime, um, and uh, not to mention mental health experts and others. So um, if we really want to solve this problem, I think we need to look much more broadly um, than uh, hearing from the law enforcement testifiers uh, that we did today. Um, so. Uh, I, I do have uh, some questions which I'm going to save for a little bit later as some others have an opportunity to, uh, to participate in the hearing as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Senator Latz. Uh, Senator Latz, uh, this hearing was not to review the causes of crime in our world. Uh, we are noticing a very sharp uh, uptick in violent crime, especially in the metropolitan area. But it's also, as our uh, police officials have said, Criminals are transit, and this criminal activity is moving into or outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul proper. Um, we, I do know that there's lots of opinions on what the cause of crime is, but we are reviewing what is happening right now and right in recent time uh, regarding crime and the rise in crime. Uh, and how police are acting and how our prosecutors are reacting to that same crime. Uh, everyone seems to be talking about it. Whenever I go out for coffee or uh, go to a restaurant, to go to church, everyone is coming up to me with the concern, what are you guys doing about prosecutors not prosecuting crime? Uh, police officers now, even on the ride in today, there was talk that a police officer doesn't feel like he should even arrest someone because the prosecutors are not even going to prosecute. This is an acute problem in the metropolitan area, especially I fear that it's, it's uh, moving, sprawling into outlying areas. Even the Star Tribune, crime but no punishment. Even they're concerned about it. Reporters in the Star Tribune are concerned about it. And they have a number of people that they've interviewed, not only in law enforcement, but in just everyday folks that are concerned about the safety of their children. When you have uh, little kids getting shot off a trampoline, that should be our number one concern. And I, I believe that we have to react quickly. We have to. Uh, try and understand the problem. We have a long session ahead of us. Uh, if we were going to try and delve into the causes of crime, um, you know, sociologists and criminologists have been studying that for hundreds of years, and we still haven't figured out why people do what they do to other people. But nevertheless, we do have the power to react to crime. That's not to negate the possibility of analyzing the causes of crime, but for the two hours we have today, uh, this is the focus of our attention. So uh, I believe that um, uh, this may be just a beginning, uh, well, not a beginning, an ongoing discussion. So well, Mr. we'll Chairman, open it up for more questions. Senator Latz. Um, just briefly, uh, the criminologists, they have figured out a lot 
about why people do what they do. Um, we've had a lot of proposals over the last couple of years uh, to specifically address some of that. Um, and many of those proposals never got hearings in the Senate. Uh, so there are a lot of underlying causes, a lot of underlying issues, including adequate funding um, through our own uh, 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 public safety department um, and uh, for community programs, intervention programs. Um, so uh, when we get an opportunity, I've, I've got some ideas of proven crime prevention uh, uh, solutions that are uh, currently being drafted in a bill form in the other body, um, uh, which I have some specific information on. And there's, there's data that backs up the effectiveness of programs like this. So uh, we just have to be willing to listen and be willing to act uh, when those are presented to us uh, and perhaps broaden our perspective on what it takes to prevent crime. Uh, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you are quite correct in your analysis of the purpose of this hearing and the purpose of the hearing uh, and one of the reasons why I really was encouraging you to call this was I wanted to talk to police officers about the issue of what is being categorized as pretextual stops and I view pretextual stops uh, and the lack of prosecution um, for felonies derived from those stops is being uh, uh, endangering the public. And, and, and I live out, out state Minnesota, out in a rural area. And when I talk to my local law enforcement, crime is migrating from the urban area into rural Minnesota. And one of the reasons why my local law enforcement feels that is occurring is because of the lack of prosecution. So Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that you are quite correct in your analysis. This is a very narrow scoped hearing. And if the judiciary wants to hold a hearing of the nature that Senator Latz wants, you are certainly entitled to do that. I think Senator Latz would be entitled to call a hearing uh, if he wanted to. But for purposes of today, I want to talk about uh, the authority of the police to stop for actions that the legislature has determined is unlawful. And I want to talk about uh, Prosecutor Choi's decision to not prosecute, specifically for crimes that are derived, felonies that are derived from that stop. And so the public understands it isn't just law enforcement that was invited to come here to testify today. John Choi was invited to come, encouraged to come, and I'm candidly very disappointed he's not here because it is his policy that he has instituted in Ramsey County, his jurisdiction, that in large measure is why we are here today. So I really am disappointed that Mr. Choi has decided not to join us. Mr. Chairman, I have three questions I would like to ask Sheriff Fletcher if he could join us at the, uh, at the table. Sir <coughs> Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sheriff Fletcher. Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. When I ask you three questions, I want you uh, both remind myself and you that there's a number of other senators that want to ask questions. So I'm going to try and be brief and hopefully you can do the same. Yes, sir. Uh, Sheriff, on uh, October 17th in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Mayor Carter made a claim that uh, he and uh, he, city officials and business leaders we're celebrating a 23% decrease in summer crime in downtown St. Paul compared with uh, 2020. Sheriff Fletcher, every statistic that I see indicates crime is on the increase, not on the decrease. Can you comment on, sure. from your view, as to whether or not crime in St. Paul is down by 23 percent. 
Mr. Chair, Sheriff of course, Fletcher. Mr. Chair, crime is, of course, significantly up in St. Paul. That figure that was being quoted pertain to the geographic boundaries of the large buildings, as Joe Souchere would say, that are downtown, of which were not occupied during that time because most employers were having people work from home. So the amount of traffic and the potential victims downtown was so insignificant that crime, of course, would be reduced in that one mile square, square area. But there are miles and miles of other activities in St. Paul that crime was significantly up, especially violent crime. Mr. Chairman. Senator Newman. Second question, Sheriff. Sure. <coughs> the, uh, uh, John Choi has, has described, as have others, uh, what they are calling pretext or pretextual stops. So I, you know, I, I just took a real quick check in the dictionary. dictionary. Yep. Uh, pretextual doesn't appear to be a word, but pretext is. And a definition of a pretext is a pretense, a ruse, or a ploy. Pretense, ruse, or a ploy. Yep. Prosecutor Choi has indicated that Pretext stops, mm -hmm. stops which I consider lawful stops for a violation of an activity the legislature has deemed unlawful. He has indicated that uh, African Americans are being targeted to the tune of about 4% more than the rest of the population. My question, Sheriff Fletcher, is, is the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department through ruse or pretense, yeah. targeting African Americans yeah. for low-level crimes uh, and stopping them. Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, of course not. Sure, sure. Yeah, but I'm glad you asked that question, and you and I have actually never visited on this issue. Um, the word pretextual should never be used by this committee or anyone else <clears throat> because it implies ill intent by the officer that is on the street. As you have correctly quoted the definition there, um, a ruse, the, these officers are not stopping cars out of pretext or ruse. They're stopping cars because they believe it to be their job based upon the laws that you have passed. And just on that matter, at, the, at our sheriff's office, we're continuing to stop and enforce all traffic stops that you've designated as being unlawful for the traffic code. Do we think that there are some that are more important than others, as Mr. Latz says? Of course. Driving violations, serious driving violations, we want to spend our time on those individuals. But that doesn't mean we're going to ignore other violations. If uh, you, you spent a lot of time on this last session in the, between the House and the Senate, and clearly there is discussion and policy that decisions that will be made on what is the right law to have in place. Um, but until the law changes, let's keep our separation of powers in place where law enforcement does one job, the county attorney does another, and the courts do the final determination. And I've told John Choi this. John is a friend of mine. We differ on a variety of issues. We talk on a regular basis. I think that um, this was a mistake for the county attorney to make the decision as to what law enforcement should or should not do. There are many police departments that have decided that this isn't the best use of their time. They have the right to do that. But it shouldn't be that that policy for the police departments is being made by county attorneys. And it's, it certainly shouldn't be that a case, a good felony case, is not brought to the court for prosecution. So uh, if, if this debate goes on, it should be about equipment-related stops or possibly poverty-related stops. I do think there is an argument that um, some people can't repair their vehicles. Let's find a way to help them repair their vehicles so that they can be law-abiding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Mr. Chairman. Newman. Final question, Chair Fletcher. 
Uh, recently, Mr. Choi was on, uh, I think it was Almanac, I could be wrong, uh, interviewed by uh, Kathy Werzer. And they were talking about John Choi's recent announcement of a policy that for uh, a stop, or I should say a felony derived from a low-level traffic stop, he was not going to prosecute. Uh, and she says, if the traffic stop of a person that is in possession of, say, a gun, and it's not, they're not supposed to have that gun, would that still be a felony? And Choi says, no. The only reason that gun was found was because of an equipment stop. He then went on to explain, and there was kind of a long rambling answer, but in a nutshell, what he said that he had conferred with all of the police in his jurisdiction uh, and, you know, about his new policy. Sheriff Fletcher, did John Choi confer with you about this policy of not prosecuting felonies that are derived from a low-level traffic stop? And do you agree with that policy? He did Sheriff confer, Fletcher. and I do not agree. And he did confer with all chiefs in Ramsey County. Um, there really is one, the Roseville police chief, that has adopted policy that is consistent with his. There are two others that are reviewing their policies to make a determination. And then St. Paul recently adopted guidelines, but not policy that is consistent with John. So there are two police agencies in our county of 13 that have supported his policy. There are two reviewing it, and the remainder are not supportive of the policy. Mr. Chairman, may I ask, ask a follow-up to that? Senator Newman. Sheriff, why don't you agree with that policy? Well, I'm a political science and government major from Hamlin University down the street, and I think the separation of powers between who establishes the law, who enforces them, and who prosecutes them is critical to everything we're doing. If you establish a rule or law and people are not enforcing it, how does the public weigh in? Where is the public input for how laws are enacted? And it's, it's not my job to determine the law. It's not my job to determine what case is going to be prosecuted. But it, it is our job in law enforcement to take what you've given us based on what the public has told you and go out and enforce those rules. And we're guided by your direction. So why don't I support it? Whether it's a good idea or bad idea, it isn't up to John. It's not up to me. It's up to you to make those decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Senator Pappas, uh, who's uh, joining us by digital means. Senator Pappas. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize. I've, I've committed to speak to a class around 11 o'clock, so thank you for calling on me. Um, I think that when we have a situation that many of the testifiers have indicated where we have a shortage of police officers, and certainly we always have a shortage of resources in government, that we need to make sure that we're not wasting those resources and be as efficient as possible. And these, uh, these equipment stops, it appears to me, are, are a wasteful use of police resources and plus unnecessarily intrusive into you know, people's, people's individual lives. Um, I mean, we're not talking, remember, about people who are driving under the influence, who are speeding, are distracted or reckless driving. We're not talking about any of those stops. We're talking about when, <clears throat> you know, your turn signal goes out suddenly. And we have plenty of data that shows that there is, um, there are excessive stops in low-income neighborhoods, mainly where black and brown people live. Uh, in fact, if we look at the situation with Philandro Castile, who was pulled over for a, um, I can't remember the reason, expired license plate, whatever it was, he actually had been pulled over 49 times in his very young life. So um, I spoke with John Choi, and um, some people call this uh, jackpot policing. You're pulling over thousands of people hoping to hit the jackpot. And for every 100 people you pull over, maybe one or two has a weapon on them or contraband. Um, 
I would, ex I, to, to just understand this, I would compare it to a homeowner. The ordinance says your grass can't be any longer than five inches. Your grass is six inches. A hundred homeowners have grass that's higher than, than five inches. And so the police decide they're gonna do a search. They're gonna search your house. And maybe, maybe they'll find contraband or maybe they'll find guns. But what about those 98 people where they don't find anything in the car, in the house? Um, how do they feel about the intrusiveness of their civil liberties in that situation? So, um, you know, I think that we all have a responsibility, not just the police, not just the elected officials. Um, John Choi is also an elected official to, um, to look at why are we having this situation, these unnecessary interactions between police and our communities of color in particular? And what can we do to reduce that? Other countries send notices in the mail if you have a, you know, a, a broken turn signal or a brake light and avoid all that. And the police resources then can be focused on more serious crimes like drunken driving or reckless driving. Um, it's really, and, and the studies have shown that that is very much more effective use of resources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll stand as long as I can. Thank you, Senator Pappas. We'll move on to Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question for you, Sheriff Fletcher, but first of all, I want to say thank you to Mr. Peters and the chiefs and the others, uh, sheriffs as well. Uh, for being here today and talking about this very important issue on behalf of the victims, on behalf of the people, because that's who you're pledged to serve and what it's really all about. And the concern I have here is, um, is represented by the people of my district as well. But the other concern I have is for the resources. So, uh, Sheriff Fletcher, when you talked about the um, re-offenders and picking them up, kind of that revolving door situation. So you pick them up, they go back out, you pick them up, they go back out. Seems to me that's a lot of law enforcement time. A lot of resources are being used on the same people uh, to go through that process instead of the first time uh, being placed in jail, taken off the street. And that's a whole lot more victims that are then uh, considered as well. But could you talk about the, the additional resources it takes to constantly be going after those repeat offenders and what that does to your workload? Well, it certainly, Chair uh, Mr. Chair, sorry. Uh, it certainly increases our workload. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer, I would say the, the, in addition to workload increase, the biggest issue is the morale killer that it is for our apprehension unit to be continually going out and arresting someone on a warrant that is quickly released on a low bail when they're brought to court. And we are talking about some very serious felons. Um, and I, I have to tell you, um, of course, every county has a different standard. Let's face it, some are more liberal in, we have the smallest, densest county in the state of Minnesota in the judge's view of the offender in society, et cetera, than others. Um, so I'm sure it's different throughout the state of Minnesota. But in our case, with COVID, we've released an awful large percentage of offenders. In fact, our jail is probably at half the capacity um, that it used to be in the past. So they're, they're, the two years that we've been through, a year and a half, have, have caused, I think, some additional movement on releasing people. In addition to that, you're aware of the bail issue. The Freedom Fund is bailing a number of people out. It's not unusual for large amounts of money to be put up for bail for serious offenders. And our county has an ongoing bail reform discussion. Let's face it, it probably doesn't make sense for a poor, poor person to be held when a wealthy person is not. I think everyone would agree on that concept. But it also doesn't make sense for a serious felon that has used the gun to be bailed out by an organization that uh, is only there to release the inmate. So, there's, there are a number of issues. I hope during the session we can have a longer conversation about that repeat offender issue. Sarah Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. 
And hearing about the low morale amongst the police officers, what I hear from Minnesotans as well is their low morale when they see repeat offenders back out and more victims. Their morale makes a difference as well. And uh, we establish the rules and the laws, and so the proper procedure uh, is to go to the legislature in that regard, and that's where those kinds of things should be happening, not on a prosecutorial basis, and as the law enforcement are there to enforce the law. And that really is your job, and I appreciate that very much. I would probably say, the folks in my district say, it seems as though there's more concern for the perpetrators of these crimes than there is for the victims of the crimes. They feel that their being um, affected by this greatly um, is really impactful to them, uh, but they feel so bad for the fact that they've been a victim, the perpetrator gets out and victimizes another person and it just goes on. And so their morale, but also they feel victimized again when the criminal is out there and the failure to prosecute. I think that headline uh, you know, tells it uh, so greatly. And I think a concern I also have is we talk about lawlessness increasing, mm -hmm. but when you have prosecutors and you have judges who don't comply with what is clearly in the law, then there's lawlessness in regards to the system itself where they are not prosecuting mandatory uh, sentencing guidelines and other things when they're not doing that. And so that whole impact is really great amongst Minnesotans. It increases their anxiety, increases their fear, and by the way, it affects the economy as well, especially in Minneapolis, St. Paul. If any place should be really concerned about this, uh, it's gonna affect the economy of these cities because what I hear from my folks, I am not going down there. Uh, maybe during the day, but certainly at night, and the more they hear about the carjackings and these other things that are serious personal injury crimes, they're saying, I'm staying home. I'm not gonna go there. And so I think these cities have a, a great deal um, at stake here. And I think that our law enforcement who are closest to the problems are the ones that I also uh, wanna hear from today. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here. But Mr. Chair, I think the morale of Minnesotans uh, and their re-victimization when criminals are left out to do so again are also a matter of great concern in addition to the morale of law enforcement. But thank you to those who do stay, who can stay. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be uh, Senator Stuart Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Limmer. Uh, thank you, all of the testifiers today, Sheriff Fletcher, Sheriff Thien, Chief Warner, Chief Anderson, and Mr. Peters. Uh, we certainly appreciate the work you do and the passion you bring to your job and keeping us safe, so thank you for that. Uh, I didn't think I was next in line, so I was a little um, disgruntled here in terms of uh, my question. I was very interested in hearing what Chief Anderson had to say, and I appreciate uh, your comments about mental health. To your point, Senator Kiffmeyer, let's remember that many of these repeat offenders are in fact not criminals, but perhaps have mental health challenges indicated in fact by the example you gave of the person who had 140 interactions. I'm sure not all of those uh, resulted in an arrest or a charge, but it's ind indicative of how mental health is really um, taxing your members and your officers, and I, I'm looking forward to figuring out some ways we can work together on that. My question is actually for my own chair, uh, Chair Newman. I am thrilled to be here. As you know, I'm new, and I have never actually sat in a hearing room before, so thanks for the experience. My, um, I am on the Transportation Committee, and my question specifically is, um, can you explain some of your thoughts for bringing the Transportation Committee here today? What specifically um, should I be doing in terms of research and what can we do from our committee perspective relating to this? I'm hearing a lot about what's happening at Ramsey County and about individual um, decisions at the county level and I, I'm confused. Uh, albeit new, I don't really understand our position here. So Senator Newman, if you could like Give me some ideas about what you're working on or what you're going to propose around this. Please, thank you. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Senator Johnson Stewart, uh, I'm very happy that I was able to accommodate uh, you in being able to come into your first committee hearing. Uh, I had frankly, you know, kind of, we kind of forgot about the fact that with COVID, uh, some of the new senators have never actually participated in a live hearing before. Mm. So thank you for reminding us. Uh, the, the reason the transportation is involved in this hearing is because the Transportation Committee has joint jurisdiction over this issue, uh, and most specifically, the uh, low-level crimes that we're talking about, the uh, uh, equipment violations that we're talking about, they are uh, uh, all within our jurisdiction. So virtually all of what Mr. Choi is referring to as pretextual stops falls solidly within the transportation jurisdiction, and that's why we're here. Uh, moving on, uh, Senator Matthews. I believe you're on uh, 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 connected via Zoom, Senator Matthews. Yes, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. And apologies for not being able to make it in person today. I wish I could have, but uh, thank you for accommodating me. I have a question for uh, Chisago County Sheriff uh, Thien, if he's still present. Sheriff Thien, is that how we pronounce your name? What is the correct pronunciation? Uh, yes, Chairman, it's, it's Sheriff Thien. Thien. Thank you, Senator uh, Mr. Matthews Chair and Sheriff Thien. And I wanted to ask you to expound a little more on, I'll call them uh, your minor traffic violations, the stops that you make for those, because your office has decided to help publicize some of that recently. Uh, you referred to one uh, example. I think I've seen um, Facebook posts of two examples in the last couple of months that have been more widely shared, and not just in light of this year, uh, what's happened this year and the notoriety that this issue has gained, but what about the, the past few years? How, with what regularity uh, does, does this happen in your jurisdiction? Uh, can you give examples of, of the frequency uh, that, that a minor stop turns into this? Uh, did you decide to review any of your policies recently in light of of uh, public opinion uh, potentially changing on the subject. Uh, and I'm asking you because uh, your county uh, is in similarities to my own. I'm to the, the west of you, uh, Mille Lacs, Sherburne, Benton County areas on the east side of St. Cloud. And so your county uh, has many similar characteristics to uh, many of my own that I represent and uh, wondered if you would uh, maybe expound more on, on what you've seen, not just this year, but maybe the past few years as this issue has gotten more attention. Sheriff Thine. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Senator Andrews. I don't think anything has changed. We have not reviewed our policies. When um, some of the information had come out of the Metro on some of the policy decisions that were being made, our county attorney and I have uh, great communication and we spoke about the, that specifically and I wanted to know uh, what her stance was gonna be moving forward um, and she is uh, supportive of that. We did, like I mentioned earlier, we, we did post on a couple of uh, situations. The other situation that I did not reference was uh, a situation where I believe a trailer uh, being pulled did not have uh, a tail, either a tail light out or no tail lights whatsoever. It was uh, maybe had a little driving conduct with it as well. But they, they stopped that trailer and, and noticed that the registration sticker on the trailer uh, looked like it had been removed. Further investigation, they learned that the uh, trailer stolen. Um, the individual with the stolen property had uh, uh, past crimes, past felonies in, in its history. And I believe there was something else uh, besides the trailer um, that uh, was involved in that stop. But like I said, when these things are being talked about or in the media, um, my residents, my constituents who I speak with every day and that I'm concerned about, they are wondering what's happening in Chisago County. 
are, are we stopping cars? The, there's statutes that traffic stops are down 50% in the state of Minnesota and up towards over 90% in Hennepin County. And that information is out there. So people are asking those questions. And that's one of the reasons why we are putting that information out so that we use our social media. If you follow us, we are uh, very active in social media in all forms to notify our followers, our residents of what's happening in the, in the county. It's, it's um, back to that community engagement that's been spoken about earlier, that's very important. And social media gives us that outlet to have that community uh, engagement without maybe having that face-to-face. -face. So that is the reason why we are posting that, to let our people know we are out there stopping cars. We do feel that equipment violations are very important. Like I mentioned, fatalities are up across the state. We are looking at going back 15 to 20 years to the numbers that what we project for the end of the year. In Chisago County, our numbers are, are up as well. As the sheriff, I routinely am stopping cars as well involved in traffic myself. And from talking with my deputies and my own experience of working patrol, these equipment violations are important. They are, in, they are important to our, our, our traffic safety, our roadways, vehicles that are missing taillights, maybe they're dimmer, vehicles at night not seeing vehicles, having headlights out. I can tell you that when I stop vehicles for um, equipment violations, minor equipment violations, most of the people that we stop do not know that it has occurred. We're not there to uh, specifically interrupt their day or to search their vehicle if if, if that situation comes to that, then yes, we take those steps. But most of the time, it's a, it's a positive contact with our community. Let them know that we're out here, that traffic safety is important. We let them know about that equipment violation. They thank us, and that is the end of it. And hopefully they get that fixed. To answer the question someone mentioned about maybe mailing out something about equipment violation, I can tell you with, uh, unfortunately, with DMV, how far they are behind and transferring of vehicles and getting names, different things like that. It is so, it is so uncommon that the people that are driving these vehicles are actually even the registered owners. So I believe in that contact in Chisago County. We have done that. It has not stopped. We've been doing that my whole career. I've worked for Chisago County for 22 years, 24 years total law enforcement within the county. As the sheriff, we will continue to, to stop people as long as you make those uh, traffic violations uh, and important from as far as uh, breaking the law, we will continue to enforce that because I believe, and from speaking with a lot of other law enforcement officials, we believe it's very important. There is a place for it. There is a connexus for some of those equipment violations to find bigger problems. And the fact that if you just happen to come in contact with someone and you have a connexus to a, a felony that's bigger, or they just maybe committed a robbery, a burglary, a homicide, maybe a rape, something to not take that as a step that you have given us. I think is detrimental. We will not do that in Chisago County. Senator Matthews, any further follow-up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Brief follow-up. And uh, Sheriff, you started to allude to what I wanted to ask next. Um, we, have, uh, we have an expectation for our law enforcement to, to treat people with honor and respect. Um, and uh, the most extreme example lately when that did not happen was the the murder of George Floyd and the actions that that officer took, and he was convicted on three charges, uh, three uh, murder and, and manslaughter charges for that result. Uh, but that's not the common uh, interaction uh, that I hear about. Um, on the other side, uh, individuals and citizens that are stopped also should be held to a standard of, of respect. And uh, wanted you, you started to allude to it, but. Uh, what difference does it make in your experience based on the reception of a person being stopped as to whether uh, 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 an, uh, an incident or a stop or a contact uh, will remain uh, respectful and cordial or whether it can escalate into something that none of us want to happen? Uh, Chairman, uh, Senator Matthews. Sure, uh, I would say based on the numbers of the traffic stops um, that Mr. Peters had made comment to, every day there are numerous stops across this country, across our state, in all of our local communities. And 
I can tell you all my deputies in, in my agency wear body cams. My supervisors review those stops to make sure that based on our policy, our procedures, based on what we believe how traffic stops should occur to be courteous, to show the motorist respect and different things like that. We are continually monitoring that. In reference to, and I, I think that goes back to the the uh, community involvement that you have with your community, you have that trust. The people that are stopping aren't thinking that you're there to uh, search their vehicle and go beyond that, that that that, that conversation has a place in, and it has to go forward with that. I think there's a lot of talk about reform and things that police should be doing different, but I think it's important that everyone and the public need to realize that they need to learn how they should be acting during the traffic stop as well. We've talked a lot about that when permit to carry came and what to do when you have a gun and you have a permit and how to act and so forth like that. And I think they, there, there should be further discussions. And, and currently I have a Citizens Academy occurring in Chisago County where we bring in members of the public. We show them what it is to be a police officer, a deputy on the street dealing with traffic stops, what it's like for a deputy to walk up to a car at night show them uh, footage of being ambushed and, and what the mentality of, of our officers are going through when they're doing that. But at the same token, I think people need to realize how they should be act. Maybe, maybe there should be, uh, you know, things brought in our educational system. If you are stopped, more talk about that, more messaging on that, because I think in some of the more high profile recent incidents that we've experienced in Minnesota, I think we probably will all agree that sometimes bad things happen during traffic stops when there isn't respect given to the stop. There's time to debate stops after the fact if things are done wrong, if there's something else. But during that time, there needs to be mutual respect from the motorist as well as the police officer to get through that situation without having a conflict and to get to the bottom of why that stop was occurring. Uh, we have, I just want to remind our committee that we have eight senators that want to ask questions, and we have uh, about 17 minutes left in our time. So if we can keep our questions short, and um, I won't be asking for follow-up comments uh, because I want to make sure everyone shares in the, in the uh, discussion. So we're going to move on to uh, Senator Carlson, and he's online. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been uh, adding notes and uh, things to my questions here, my question. But uh, I, I want to make sure that I get, I'll talk fast, get uh, the uh, notes in here. Uh, one is that I want to say that I agree with Senator Latz's opening statement that we, we do have some experts that we should be bringing in here. And uh, you know, I think that uh, we can't really make a, any kind of uh, judgments if we don't have that kind of input from that side of the issues. Um, <clears throat> and also, I think we've said that this is a, a meeting about pretextual stops, but we've jumped around a lot and I would like to bring us a little bit narrower because we've talked about pretextual stops, we talked about not prosecuting felons, we talked about probable cause stops, habitual offenders, and reasons for staffing issues and funding issues. It's just been a, a whole, um, a bucket of things that have come up in here, not just pretextual stops. And I want to say that uh, uh, Sheriff Fletcher has an excellent point in his points about uh, pretextual stops, that when we have an equipment problem, there's another issue there, that some people can't get their automobiles fixed. And I, I know that in here in Egan, we would have coupons that would uh, be given to the driver and they could go to any place that replaces a headlight and get a free headlight. So that's the kind of thing that I think we need to make sure that we think about uh, so that uh, uh, we don't have any kind of conflict between the person who has stopped and the person who is stopping them. And I wanna, okay, now I'm gonna get to my question. Well, one more thing, and that is that we have reasons to stop people for instance, uh, carjacking. We've identified the car that being stolen and that is probable cause right then and there. So when we talk about a, uh, fleeing the police, they've already 
been identified as someone of, as a, that's a person of interest because that car has been stolen. And so now they're doing another felony by running from the police. So we're not talking about a pretextual stop in that case. We're talking about a stop with probable cause. But I would like to ask a question here of uh, Sheriff Thion from uh, um, Chisago County. He made a statement about fear-based police reform. And I was a little bit confused on that. I'm wondering if he could expand just a little bit on what he means by fear-based police reform. Uh, Sheriff, could you expand in a brief, brief statement uh, regarding that? I, I know it's probably a huge dissertation that you'd really like to uh, entertain us with. But, uh. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chairman. Yes, in reference to fear-based uh, police reform, in when I mentioned uh, a lot about what my deputies are feeling is they're, they're fearful to do their job. The, the deadly force statute was changed. There's a lot of questions on the interpretation of that. We thought it was one interpretation and then another interpretation came. What we've seen in some more recent incidents with some of the um, reform is, is if they're not doing it a certain way, the media, the, uh, the social media, media that's out there will attack them for their actions without due process. When, when different things are happening, we're not getting to the courtroom to hear all the facts. So much gets put out immediately, judgment gets put out immediately, and, and that's why they're, they're, they're feared for sometimes doing their job. So when we're talking about some of the reform that's out there, to get them to change what they're doing, there's fear behind that for them to do their jobs. They're not supported. They don't fully, ex they're, not fully uh, they're not fully involved. Law enforcement sometimes isn't fully involved in the discussion on that reform. Other special interest groups to get to put in their information without sometimes law enforcement getting to get to the end game for those discussions. So you are right. I could, I could talk a very long time in reference to that, but that is kind of why I made that comment. All right. Uh, we'll thank move on. Comments. Pardon me? Okay. Just thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the comments, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Sarah Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question is for Chief Anderson. Uh, and I'm going to make a statement while he's getting up there. I, I will say that people need to keep in mind how important traffic stops are because the Oklahoma City Federal bo Building Bomber was caught. Timi McVeigh, uh, Timothy McVeigh was caught because of a traffic stop. We can only imagine what would happen if that would have continued. But uh, Chief Anderson, I know that uh, I've got two questions that aren't related. That's the, the issue that I face. But, uh, you know, we talked about CAT teams, the uh, community action teams. And I know that we worked on that a long time and uh, you went forward without legislation to make it happen. But there was a real problem there at the beginning, trying to get uh, the ability to share information. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? And just tell us what we could do to help that be more successful so we could maybe be, it'd be an easier time to branch that out into other communities. Chief Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, <clears throat> excuse me. The Minnesota Medical Records Act is more restrictive than HIPAA. And the lunacy that surrounds that, for lack of a better way of saying it, is simply this. Those individuals I mentioned earlier each had several different entities working on their behalf, whether it was public health, social services, probation, you name it. But we can't share that information. And so we wind up arresting people or depriving them of their civil liberties by taking them in on a 72 hour hold or to detox more times than I, I would care to have to do that because that is so restrictive that I can't sit down with that person's social worker and, and get the backstory and try to figure out some other ways to help that individual. And, and it is more restrictive than HIPAA. 
And so we really need some help with that before we can expand this, uh, I think, to the level that it needs to be expanded to. Mr. Chair? Sir, how? My other question was, is you, you elaborated on it was important, how important it was to try and get that federal charge. Why, why is that important to get the federal charge and why can't, why isn't it, why can't we take that care of that with uh, just our county or our, our state charges? Chief Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the obvious answer is that uh, in, in federal court, when, when you're given a 10-year sentence, you're not home in three or four. You're going to do 80 to 85 percent of, of the time that, that you are sentenced to do minimally. Uh, and it's not that we can't use our, our local and our, our county jurisdictions to do that, but quite frankly, the, the, the penalty is a little more severe. Uh, and, and for some people, some people are slow learners, some don't learn at all, uh, unfortunately. And so that's the reason why. And, and of course, uh, it depends on the severity of the case uh, and the person's criminal history. Thank you, uh, Chief Anderson. Um, Remi watching the clock, we're about nine and a half minutes left, and I still have seven members that want to ask questions. Uh, they keep adding to the list. Senator Begum, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I would say that if we go a little over, no one's going to go to jail. So maybe we could have <laughs> some flexibility, sir. Um, a couple things. Uh, the Minnesota Medical Act uh, needs some reform, 100%, and it's been roadblocked specifically by this body, uh, this majority. So 100% um, agree with you. I've heard that from law enforcement. I've heard of it through primary care folks. Um, I think that the conversations that have happened today are fantastic. But I do disagree with the chair because we do need to get to the root of what the crime is um, and what's causing crime. It is mental health. I mean, I've done ride-alongs. I've spent this interim, for lack of a better word, spending a lot of time with law enforcement. I have done ride-alongs with the Cottage Grove Police Department. Witness, I've done a lot of, through my elected career and appointed career, I've done a lot of ride-alongs. Never once have I had a domestic call that I went on a ride along with, first one. Um, it, that, when an officer is trying to deal with somebody who's just been beaten, uh, it's hard. And that person gets out of jail or gets back and keeps victimizing. We ought to be looking at how we can protect that situation and getting at the root of the violence. Same with mental health and chemical health. That's what most of these calls are. And we ought to be giving the resources to law enforcement to do that. And Mr. Chair, that's, that's what's missing from this, from this hearing. Where are the advocates for domestic violence? We tried to get major reforms through and we ended up doing it, but it was a two day hearing through this committee. And those were Republican bills. Um, we need to be, Sheriff Fletcher, um, wonderful ideas, wonderful ideas that he's bringing up here. And, and I want to be part of these conversations. But they've all said the same things. Multidisciplinary teams work. Co-response teams work. Mr. Chair, where are the other co-partners in this hearing? You didn't bring them here today. And they should be here today because they're their partners. Those social workers in Washington County that ride along in Dakota County, that ride along with law enforcement. Where are they today? Because that's their partners that make their job easier. My main question that I wanted to come here to ask is I'm very concerned that Minneapolis PD is down 300 officers. St. Paul PD, Sheriff Fletcher, down over 100 and some officers. I would like one of the very excellent testifiers to answer a question for me. What can we do as legislators besides not shifting local government aid from Minneapolis and St. Paul to other areas, which has happened last session, 
how do we help from a state's perspective fill those vacancies? Because those vacancies need to be filled. They're budgeted at a certain level, but they're not staffed to a certain level. And that's problematic because that's how you do the proactive community policing so that you can build those relationships and that trust in the community so when stuff goes down, that you can tap into those relationships and say, hey, this business keeps getting pinged on Selby Dale. What's, you know, you know, that's, that's what Sheriff Fletcher and, and that's what Chief Axtell and these suburban cops need to be able to do. And if they're constantly in reactive mode, constantly reacting, they burn out. I'm glad that departments have put overtime pay in. Great, because it's the law. You're going to burn them out. They're not robots. Cops are not robots. They need help. So how is a state, and can we help? I wish Colonel Langer was here. Colonel Langer, I'm, there's a lot of folks around this table that were up at the Troopers Academy, and he talked about their ability to hire. The two-prong approach, you have the traditional um, post um, path, and then you have the other path, the alternative path. Maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a social worker, and now you want to be a trooper. Excellent. What can we do as a state? Do we have a massive academy, Mr. Chair? Maybe we put some resources. We have a lot of one-time money. Maybe we do a massive academy that people can hire from, that local uh, law enforcement agencies can hire from, put them in their field training program. I guess I, I would like some thoughts and suggestions from either um, Sheriff Fletcher or, or any of the other law enforcement folks up here um, to, to talk about how we can help close that gap of the staffing so that we can do proactive policing, so that we can do community engagement. Can and again, I, thank I, you to all the speakers. Can could I try I, and uh, answer? Can I step in here? Uh, the focus of this meeting was law enforcement, difficulties of law enforcement, what they're experiencing right now, and the failure of some prosecutors not prosecuting. Uh, we're getting a little far afield from, uh, on the subject matter, Senator Begum. Um, we had, um, I had just given a warning of 10 minutes. You've used up the committee time at, for seven minutes talking uh, about a wide variety of issues outside of that scope of the meeting. So. Uh, I hope we can stay focused on the subject. Mr. You, Chair, you, I got the whole day a, off, so a, I'm good. Do you have a question regarding uh, the scope of the meeting? Well, I have a lot of questions about the scope and how narrow it is, because it's not going to get us where we got to go. But I believe that the suggestions that Chair Fletcher and the other chiefs have proposed deserve more merit and more discussion. And one of those is being understaffed. This isn't the John Choi show. This is a Judiciary Committee and Transpo Committee, Mr. Chair. So I would ask that um, the sheriffs, how we can help better staff um, as a state, give you resources or whatever you think to better staff and fill that gap so you can do community policing and proactive policing. Sheriff, whichever one you want. I, I can or, I can try and address I mean, that. Chief, I'm sorry. I, I, I do have a, a, a couple of suggestions. Most people aren't going to like the first one, <laughs> and I don't care. The fact that Minneapolis and St. Paul are down significantly is not as simple as it seems. Chief Arredondo asked for several hundred additional officers. There aren't 700 candidates in the pool for him to hire. Unless we want to change the trajectory, which has been helpful in making ours one of the more respected law enforcement professions in the state, the post standards and, and the requirements, the minimum requirements. But until it's taken out of the hands of Ms. Minsky, it's going to continue to flounder. Here's why I say that. The program that's run through Minsku, obviously, to get you to the point where you can take your, your post exam and become a licensed peace officer here is treated like any other curriculum in a college or university system. What that means for us is somebody can go through that entire curriculum and not be eligible to be a police officer. But they can't dissuade them from doing that any more than they can somebody who says, I want to go into accounting. 
right? And so we put a lot of people through these programs that can't withstand the scrutiny of a background investigation or have a medical condition they didn't know of. And I'm speaking from personal experience uh, in, in my almost 20 years as an administrator. There have been numerous candidates who have gotten all the way to that place only to find out they have a heart murmur. They never knew. They can't pass a psychological evaluation. Uh, and so there needs to be an alternative. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, and, and to me, that's where one of the areas where perhaps we can shore this up. The other one, um, you, you guys really want to help us? Help us change the narrative. What you've heard from myself and all of my colleagues is it's, it's just a, a scratching the surface of what's really happening out here. There are people out here uh, now who never would have thought of being disrespectful or not obeying a lawful order that just don't care anymore because the most strident voice has been the voice of the advocates and the so-called activists. And I know exactly what Sheriff Thien meant when he said fear-based police reform. reform. What other profession in the history of professions has been asked to completely reform itself without asking subject matter experts how best to do that? That is what has been happening for the last couple of years. And so when I hear, let's bring in this expert or let's bring it, what do you think we are? We are experts. It only takes 10,000 hours to be considered an expert in your given profession. Most of us here have 20 years plus. And I don't say that arrogantly, but we are experts. And so to ask people who've never worked a shift, who's never been on a ride along, what they think is best for us or how we should be doing our jobs is insidious. And just, and I, I'm, just to get to the, the issue of the traffic stops, here's what hasn't been said today that is as important as anything else. The public expects us to do that kind of work. I have proof. We've done 6,000 traffic stops in St. Cloud already this year, and my phone rings every day about speeders, about loud vehicles, about raggedy vehicles on the roadway. And I can tell you personally, uh, of the thousands of traffic stops I've made in my career, solved a whole bunch of felonies from a taillight out. A whole bunch. We had an incident not one week ago in St. Cloud where a low-level traffic stop netted two kilos of drugs, illegal guns, and a whole bunch of money. And so you all don't want us to be frustrated when the prosecutor from uh, the major metropolitan city in our state says that they won't prosecute that? It's going to cause people to stop doing proactive work, and these problems are going to get worse. It is dangerous. If you don't want us to do no-knock warrants, don't call me when the drug dealer moves in down the street from you because they're a valuable tool. Mr. Chair, one minute to address Senator Bingham's question. One minute, no longer. Chair Fletcher, um, how about 30 seconds? 30 seconds. I'm sorry, uh, I took some No, no time problem. Here. Hey, Senator Bingham, thank you for everything you said. Uh, I agree with everything you said. We should have a more robust discussion there, and we appreciate your support of law enforcement. Um, to the issue of respect, we need to earn respect every single day on this job. We don't demand it, we earn it, and I think that most of our officers uh, have earned that. Finally, when I got hired in 1976, there were 1,891 applicants for the St. Paul Police Department job, 1,891. Your Commissioner of Public Safety, John Harrington, and I took the test at the same time in the old St. Paul Civic Center. This last year, there were less than 200 applicants in St. Paul. There are lots of reasons, some minskew, some the environment. I will tell you, if before I pass away, the one thing I want to change is help us open up the field 
for who can become police officers. We would love to have social workers that want to change careers, teachers that want to change careers, people that have good communication skills that can work with people. We need to invite them in. Most of them won't change jobs. It's too expensive to go back to get schooling, et cetera. So that dual path of actually getting hired is important for our culture and for our staffing. And that's this session, if we can work on opening those paths, I would be appreciative. Thank you. Well, I tried 30 seconds, but um, <laughs> uh, I've been told we can, we can go for about 10 more minutes. So quarter two will be a hard, a hard uh, stop. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll limit myself to, to one question for Sheriff Fletcher. As you know, someone I love dearly, my dad, is one of the men in uniform under you. And so I care very deeply about the safety of our law enforcement officers. How do actions like freeing violent felons from the Freedom Fund, like you mentioned, or decisions coming down from John Choi to not prosecute more serious crimes from traffic stops impact the safety of the men and women you oversee? Yeah. Well, um, Sheriff Fletcher. Mr. Chair, certainly the, uh, the more emboldened criminals get about their ability to commit crime and be released causes them to be emboldened to no, do more crime. And the sense of lawlessness, the sense of the police really can't tell me what to do, that's grown dramatically in the last year and a half. It is more dangerous out there now than it ever has been. Um, releasing serious criminals is part of that. Part of it is they almost always flee from us at high speed. Uh, part of it is they're not hesitant to use guns because guns are no longer sort of a mandatory five-year sentence. It's, it's a complex, as you know, as your father knows, and he's been at it as long as I have. Um, but there are more guns on this street. We have one of our top deputies in the back here who has seized hundreds of guns from stops. There are more guns now than there ever were when your dad and I first started. And uh, less hesitancy to use them. And while I don't like to criticize people's narrative, the narrative that's been created in some Minneapolis political corners has caused some criminals to believe that it's okay to be resistant and use force with police officers. Having said that, I think we're evolving out of it. I'll tell you that the public, we're sensing that the public is finally saying, okay, Derek Chauvin was convicted, maybe not all cops are bad, and we're, we're moving in the right direction, and Chair Limmer's gonna say I'm talking too long. <laughs> so. uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll try and be somewhat quick as well. Senator Kiffmeyer hit on a bunch of points I was going to talk about. Uh, she hit it very well. And the reason I'm here and talking today, and uh, this is a great meeting, uh, people are afraid to go to Minneapolis and St. Paul. Yeah. They are, and that's going to be the detriment of our state if people yes. cannot tour and recreate and do everything they can in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I believe there's a big cause and effect. And I think Brian Peters hit it right on. There is lack of support from mayor and city council across the state, mostly in the metro, that are not supporting their police. And I believe that's why the numbers are down. I've talked to a lot of police. Uh, I've been involved in different police circles for different things, back to my mayor days. Uh, police officers are getting out of the industry because of what's going on. Our numbers are down because people, police officers, are getting out. They are getting the tools taken away from them, what they can use to do simple stops that we talk about today and it's become a no fear of discipline. And I hope that does change. Um, you know, and there's a lot of mental health issues going on as well, and even with COVID, you know, I think there's obviously more and more that have come along. There's been a lot in the in prior to this because we, as on a bonding tour, we go across the state and hear about mental issues across the state. But I think having people at home not working, collecting a check and not actively being involved in the American work ethic that we used to have and going to work every day and feeling good about themselves and coming home 
and not having those mental health issues have also contributed to this. But I want to thank all our testifiers. You guys did a great job. Uh, but I think the numbers that we're seeing in law enforcement is coming down because there is a lack of support for our law enforcement by many mayors and city councils. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dibble is uh, online. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today to discuss what is an uh, extremely important subject. Um, but, uh, Mr. Chair, I do, I do need to respond um, to yours and Senator Newman's um, uh, uh, regular uh, refrain that this is not a discussion about um, the, the causes of crime, but rather uh, it is just simply to hear from law enforcement uh, about their perspectives. Yet, uh, what I continually hear from yourself, Mr. Chair, as well as Senator Newman, as well as the, uh, you know, a few of the police professionals who are present, are that the conclusions you've drawn already going into this um, uh, hearing, evidenced by, of course, your, your piece that showed up in the Star Tribune a few days ago, um, is that you've, this is a discussion about uh, causes of crime, and there are some preformed conclusions about what they are, and they all center on, um, you know, police and how they feel about uh, a variety of issues. Um, the, the truth, uh, you know, so basically what I'm hearing is, you know, we're here to hear from people to tell us what we want to hear uh, about preformed conclusions. And I just don't think, Mr. Chair, that that does uh, service to what I think is an extremely important conversation that we absolutely need to have. Uh, regarding violence, of course, we know that uh, increases in violence are not unique to Minnesota. Uh, there's a wide array of factors. Uh, we've already heard very eloquently from Senator Latz and Senator Johnson Stewart, Senator Bigham, and others. Um, and even, even uh, the chief from, uh, I think, St. Cloud uh, did a beautiful job. And, and even Sheriff Fletcher said some great things about, uh, about youth development and the like. Economic dislocation, the challenges surrounding the pandemic, um, you know, uh, a disregard uh, and, and disappointment in the institutions that serve our society. Simply put, police cannot create public safety all by themselves. They have to be effective. They have to have legitimacy. And to do that, they need to have strong, positive relationships with the communities that they serve in. And to prevent crime, Mr. Chair, we need to talk about our constituents having good paying jobs, healthy, communities, good health, uh, good childhoods, uh, living in clean and vibrant communities, and opportunities for positive social connections. I understand violence. As a gay man, I have been subjected to violence on that basis. I have had friends who have been severely injured and murdered because of that, because of who they are. And Mr. Chair, I absolutely want justice to be served. I want those perpetrators to be held to account. I want effective public safety services and effective prosecutions in those instances. But you know what else I want? I would have wanted those perpetrators to have received the kinds of mental health services that they needed. And I wanted them to hear different messages about what it meant to live in and around and among people different from themselves, especially members of the LGBTQ community. So I invite the members of this panel to maybe hold up the mirror and understand the effect and the consequence of their actions when they refuse to support things like hate crimes laws or anti-bullying efforts or conversion therapy uh, efforts and the like. To say that some people are less than is sending a message and it creates a context and a climate for crime and violence. Or to those larger issues when we refuse to support things like minimum wage increases or the working family tax credit or transit so that people can act, have access to their jobs or paid family medical leave and earn sick and safe time or expansion of child care or, or you know how much we got for homeless youth supports in this last session? Senator Dibble, do you have a question for our guests here? I'll finish up my statement in just a second. Uh, you know, summer youth employment programs were defunded by members of your party uh, and that does a disservice to, to crime prevention issues. Um, you know, giving voice to attacks on, on our democracy and the like. And I'm very glad that, per, that, that uh, Sheriff Fletcher is here because this really brings the point home. He talked about uh, the, the enhanced dollars for his crime task force. I can't even remember what it's called. The fact of the matter is Sheriff Fletcher had no conversations with Metro Transit about that initiative whatsoever. 
Mr. Chair, I asked you about that issue on the floor and you had no knowledge of Metro Transit's uh, collaboration on that initiative. There was zero. Now he's in asking for $2 million more. I talked to Metro Transit. We had an initiative that was holistic and research-based that would have gone to uh, you know, really addressing effectively the issues of crime and violence and other sorts of social disorder on our transit system. Would have included some enhanced police response, but it had a whole lot of aspects connecting people to the kinds of supports and services and creating more order on our trains and our buses that we needed. That was research driven. That was an initiative of mine, a bill you refused to hear, yet you handed $250,000 to Chair Fletcher for a project that he conceived of all on his own. So Mr. Chair, I would invite us to have another hearing that is more holistic and more expansive and more meaningful so that we can really get underneath the issues that we all say we care about. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator, uh Senator Dibble, we uh, and Sen all the senators, uh, the whole issue of criminal justice is a very complex one. Uh, we all know that. And uh, we're taking a very narrow look at how law enforcement works in an era where prosecution is not taking place on some areas. Prosecutorial discretion is not limited anymore to case-by-case -case cases but it seems to uh, adopt an entire class of law that prosecutors are not going to uh, prosecute on, uh, despite the fact that we in the legislature are the ones that make the policies in the state. We make the laws and prosecutors do not. They administrate the will of the public that's represented in the legislative branch of government and then endorsed by whoever the governor is at that time. Uh, right now, the time is um, 11, 11.45. We're 15 minutes over our deadline. We had three other uh, senators that wanted to make comment, but we are out of time um, due to the fact that some were a little more verbose than others despite the warning. So we stand adjourned. Thank you.